It says in Ecclesiastes that the spirit goes back to the father, but the spirit and soul, if not connected in a sense of entering into that relationship um, that Jesus has already accomplished, then the soul is, has not entered through Jesus. But the spirit was always come from God. The spirit came into the body to form the soul yeah. if you like the soul formed after the spirit entered into the cells and the spirit for soul formed but the spirit always existed and just goes back to where it was before the spirit for me i don't believe in an unredeemed spirit i believe the spirit has always been from god just was not connected to our identity the person who has been awakened and is a believer yeah Okay, should they, uh, you know, using the old school term, backslide, and uh, in my background, we used to say go back into the world, and, you know, <laughs> I mean, really go back into a, quote, sinful life, whether that might be mm -hmm. drugs and wine and women, whatever, just, yeah. and, you know, they're not interested in, in God anymore. Okay, mm -hmm. so when they pass, when they mm -hmm. die, um. I would, uh, my thinking would be mm -hmm. God is going to deal with them at that point and yet give them the opportunity to go forward into the joy of the Lord, etc. I would think they still have the freedom to choose. And if they have been living that way and they choose to reject the Lord, they would go into the fire of God's love. But what is your thought there? Um, no, I wouldn't really think that because in a sense that that's putting what happens in the future based on what we haven't done or done here my view is if someone has enters into a relationship god or becomes awakened to that um what they're awakened to is the reality that god has already forgiven them they're already born from above that the, they're entering into the work of the cross which is finished and they're enjoying that whilst they're operating in that relationship. Should they choose to walk independently of God again, there is no grace to restore them other than the grace that's already restored them. So there's nothing. That's what it talks about in Hebrews about. Well, there's no there's no other way. There's no other way. They've already received the way. They may then have consequences of what's happening to them on earth. If they choose to live a life and go back into drug, well, they could end up dying in, for, from doing that. And therefore, they're almost saying, well, I don't need God's protection. I'm doing this myself. And they're going back to following the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which has consequences. You know, and those consequences aren't God punishing them. They are the result of the choices they make on Earth. When they get into that, let's say they do die physically. And they have been awakened, even though they might have chosen to forget that or accept it, then it says God will wipe away their tears. So there's a sense where they enter in. They don't have to go through the fire of they will face the judgment seat because that judgment seat is fire. But it's not it's not the fire that people don't know God. It's the fire for those who do know God. And we, of course, can enter that judgment seat now and don't have to go through that later date in a way because our scroll can be purified and there can be gold, silver, precious stones and all the wood, hay and straw can be removed. Now, they might have very few gold, silver and precious stones on their scroll because <laughs> they might have not really fulfilled most of what God has called them to do from this earthly perspective. And they might have a load of straw and wood, hay and rubbish and all that stuff. So that will get purified by the fire of God's eyes and the regret and loss will be wiped away and all the tears are wiped away. So there's no hindrance to them entering into an ongoing fulfillment of their destiny, which outworks in the realms of heaven um, because he wipes away their tears by putting them through that process. But it's not the same as those who never entered into a relationship with Jesus who go to the fire of a different place. It's still the fire of God's love, and it's just how that gets out, out worked differently. I think. Um, so they don't they don't go back to a lost state because 
in a sense, the lost state is only the state of their mind at the time. Um, from God's perspective, no one's lost, are they? They're still his. He's not lost them. They're, they've lost who they are. He's not lost them. They're still his. They're still his child, children. They, he still loves them. He's not lost them, but they've lost touch with him. So that then gets dealt with. So I don't think they have to go through the same process as someone who's never entered into a relationship with God and would have no idea of what their scroll was. Um, they would have had some idea. They may have chosen for various reasons. I mean, some people go, go through that because of trauma. Some people through religious abuse and they reject church, you know, um, and some get sucked into it through mystic people who take them back into drugs to go and get into supernatural experiences so there's all sorts of stuff out there um but i wouldn't say you know people say well can you lose your salvation well you never you never sort of gained your salvation through works so you can't lose something that never was accomplished by works you know jesus said god no one can snatch you out of the father's hand my and question would be, it. though, since yeah. God does respect our choice, yeah. if they have chosen consciously and deliberately, no, nah, I don't want God anymore, and yeah. forget it, and even though they continue with that mindset, they're still going to yeah. go into the presence of the Lord. Well, from my perspective, that's what I've seen. Um, I've seen people coming into that realm and going to various places, Um yeah, you know, I remember having an encounter with a group of us and we were watching people come into the realm of heaven and where they went. And it was like, oh, there's several places people are going here. Where are they going? Where are they going there? You know, so that was just my experience. Now, it, in one sense, it's a mute point because anyone who did go into that place and already had an awakened sense and they'd chosen a different way are going to choose to come back pretty quick. Yeah, because they already have an awakened conscious conscience. They just may have seared it. But I generally think that, that what Jesus does with those people, because they have chosen, and even though you can say, well, they, they went back on their choice, I think they would go through the fire of a different process. But it, to be honest, it doesn't really matter in the long run because they're all going to enter and be restored to relationship with God one way or another just depends on which which way and how long they want to resist that choice um you know for me love wins love overcomes um but some of it some of the question i think comes from you know backsliding in those days was losing your salvation and therefore there was no way out you know well i never i never believed that you could lose no matter what you did even those days you know i never believed in you know losing your salvation because i think i came from a calvinistic perspective well god chose you but but calvinism obviously is a limited choice only chooses some whereas now i believe god chooses everybody <laughs> so so i'm still probably more aligned to well it's more about god than it is about us <laughs> And what happens to us is more about God and therefore God's goodness, kindness, patience, tolerance, faithfulness than our faithfulness. So I always place it, well, what's God's character like and what would God do in this situation? And that's what would probably shape my understanding of it, because God is tolerant. He's patient. And in my background, we were all, always losing our salvation the moment we sinned, even yeah. if we had had too many bad thoughts or yeah but that's that the case so was. Much bondage wasn't it i mean it's so much bondage. absolutely it was there was some therefore religious system that you had to go through to get back again you know repentance probably oh. and making amends in some way to god and you would usually feel oh god, you know how many times did i bargain with god you know you know it's like well i'll i'll go to all the prayer meetings then or you know i'll i'll, I'll do this for you and i'll do that for you because because I didn't have an assurance of the, you know, the sort of a security of it's all about what God has done, what Jesus has done. It's not about what I've done. So we got a you know, super stringent teaching that was even Catholic. Like we believe that, OK, you're separated from God and you've fallen into an unrighteous state. Hmm. So you can't 
confess to God directly, you have to go to your pastor oh, right. who's in right standing or mm -hmm. someone who is who he has authorized yeah. Yeah. to receive confession so they can get you right, you know? Yeah. I mean With bondage. With bondage. It is it is bondage. And I think it, it it's all based in a wrong understanding of who God is and then that those doctrines develop around a more of an old covenant view of what the sort of the Hebrew people thought of God because they rejected the relationship. You know, they rejected the marriage, set up the mediatorial system because they were afraid of God. Effectively, when God was on the in the fire and the smoke on the mountains, oh no, we're not going up there. Moses, you go. You know, Seventy elders, you can go. But actually, no, we're we're quite happy down here. Thanks. And we'll make our own golden calf. To, to worship God the way we want, you know, it's like, you know, so, you know, that, that was the system that they chose. And of course, in that system, they didn't know God in reality, you know, they didn't really know him. You know, he tried to get them to know him. And there were probably some who did, who lingered in his presence, like Joshua and Caleb, who, who lingered in his presence and got to know him and found an intimacy in knowing him. But even they didn't have the spirit in them which is the change from the old covenant to the new. Sometimes the spirit came upon them, prophets, priests, kings, you know, they had the spirit upon them. And sometimes artisans had the spirit upon them to help them with their, their artistic work. When they made the tabernacle and all those things, the spirit came upon them for certain things. Um, but it was very different from in the new covenant, everyone's alive in Christ and the spirit's in everybody um they just don't know it and haven't entered into a relationship with the spirit in that way um so yeah i think that comes really from just not really knowing god of course jesus came as the express image of the father and said well if you've seen me you've seen the father you don't need to look anywhere else you know i've come to tell you the truth and i've come to reveal the truth and actually you know, you've heard it said about God, but it isn't true, effectively. I'm telling you now, this is, and I'm showing you in reality, what is the truth? You can see it by looking at my life, because I represent the Father's life, and I only do what I see the Father doing. You know, it was fully, you know, and you don't see Jesus killing anybody, um, murdering anyone. Yes, he was, in some senses, direct to some of them and spoke the truth to some of them in love. To try and shake them out of their false belief systems and he wasn't very happy of those who were leading the others astray into a pit <laughs> um, and he did yes he did uh, drive people out of the money changers tables but you know any anger he demonstrated was still an expression of love because he he wanted them to come into the knowledge of the truth you know even when it said after all of the woes woe unto you it was still he wanted to gather them like a chick would gather its hens under its hens under the chicks under the wing, you know. So even then, every warning he gave was not so that they would fail to heed the warning and be die, but that they would embrace the warning and live in abundant life. The enemy came to rob, kill, and destroy, not not Jesus. You know, in fact, Jesus did not come to judge the world. It said, but to save it. You know, and I think sometimes we've sort of got other things a little bit mixed up with, you know, how they describe God from their undifferentiated, non-intimate perspective of God. And that's really, unfortunately, what a lot of what we've based our new covenant teaching on is old covenant teaching, which is why Hebrews 6, which is really Hebrews is a whole book about understanding the differences between the covenants, says, do not lay in again a foundation of repentance from dead works faith in god you know baptisms or washings that's right. that was my apostolic yeah. jesus name background now the, those were the foundational principles oh, totally. I, I taught i background. taught them i taught them as foundations myself i understand. Re realizing it says move on from the elementary teachings about jesus or about the christ or messiah from the that's perspective cool. of you know move on from that you don't need you don't need to understand that anymore because now he's in you you don't need the externals of laying hands on an animal to transfer your sin or any of those understanding of what eternal judgment or, you know, resurrection would have been from that old covenant perspective. Because they did, some of them did believe in resurrection. 
obviously Sadducees and Pharisees had a bit of a disagreement over the literal or spiritual mention of resurrection or what it meant. But, you know, in, in Daniel, it talks about resurrection, but it talks about it in the same language as it talks about the end of the old and the destruction of the old and the temple system. You know, so it, it's really referring to the fact that we're all alive in Christ rather than some physical resurrection at the end of the world. Um, Because it's all mentioned in the same thing that Jesus put together in the same passage as well. Or here's what's going to happen when this old covenant ends. Make sure you escape. Don't stay in that system and die physically. Um, You know, because you can escape and receive life. You know, and be saved. You know, we tend to have so spiritualized salvation that we miss some of the context is actual physical salvation from harm (laughs) and from death you know because it's all become so just spiritual well you'll go to heaven one day you know and actually there's so much more meaning to it in terms of sozo and the meaning of health and wholeness and the fullness of what we receive in our inheritance in christ um but also i think people neglect sometimes the word i had a total meaning of physically being saved you know from harm or drowning or other things in the context of what it was originally spoken you know so yeah a lot of this all comes down to do we really know god in intimacy heart to heart face to face therefore some of those things i think will come out of that knowing his heart and knowing his unconditional love and knowing that actually forgiveness is not based on performance of any work is based on what jesus has already done love keeps no record of wrongs you know religion keeps record of all sorts of wrongs and tries to change people in the way of some again more performance you know in whichever way you get changed and obviously different streams have different versions of getting changed some would be obviously pure catholic stream of well say three hail marys and do a few of this and this and that and the other and you're absolved you know you know but oh you better squeak in the perfect act of contrition into that because that is yes well yeah because that's all part of it isn't it you know all part of the system i mean i know very little about any of it because i i wasn't really in any of that system so i you know i had no catholic pillars holding up the framework of my thinking in my mind i did have protestant pillars you know or a protestant pillar and a, an augustinian one and a evangelical one and a solar scripture one and you know i didn't realize how influenced i was by a you know a mindset that had old covenant thinking and greek thinking you know i had greek thinking and hebrew thinking from an old covenant perspective framing my reality even though i'd never learned greek or hebrew but it wasn't it's the cultural programming that my religious upbringing had which was quite legalistic and old covenant you know as well as the greek mindset which wasn't just in the religious thinking it was also in the world our western world is mostly based on greek philosophy you know and a western world that i was brought up in would be very different from an eastern world that some other people will be brought up in so they wouldn't have that pillar in their mind perhaps they would have a different pillar holding up their thinking from an eastern perspective and maybe they'd have a mystical pillar but that wouldn't necessarily make it good you know (laughs) from an eastern meditative philosophy you know which is very much you know focused on emptying the mind rather than fixing the mind on something good which would be god yeah. So, anyway. so before i give up the ball i'm i'm curious uh justin's last zoom meeting yeah uh recently he mentioned that he was disturbed by he was vexed by uh, uh apparently there are a number of mystical uh separations in light of doctrine mm. where yeah. they were uh separating themselves he did not share what it was i'm wondering if you're familiar yeah i am yeah i am i I was also extremely saddened by um you could call one of the fathers of the mystical movement who published a video on facebook on youtube which basically said that there was a group of people he was in relationship with where he was completely withdrawing from relationship from them 
on the basis of their doctrine and belief. And uh, it's not something that I'm unaware of, because obviously I've been subject to that myself on the same group as has Justin over the basis of the restoration of all things and a few other things. But this was over something which didn't seem to me worthy of doing that. Not that ever we should be separating relationship on the basis of beliefs, because we're all one in Christ, regardless of what we believe. Um, and I was very, very saddened by the public statement and all the comments that people made on it that were so, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The issue was the issue was uh, over alien human spirits. Of teaching that there were or I would call them lingering human souls, that they could affect people and needed releasing and and helping to pass on or you know helping people not to be afflicted by that whether they be familial or whatever and in this video that was what the doctrine was that he was separating from a group over now for me he then goes into he then went into a whole spiel on you know birthing demons from within actually which is like okay i'm sure that's not particularly orthodox teaching either that a lot of people would argue with you over if you're saying well i can birth demons but i can't restore them um you know in a sense but uh, i you know that to me is a kabbalah teaching and i'm not really interested in that um but it was a sad issue of i am telling you publicly that i'm withdrawing from a group over this doctrine and we're no longer in relationship and of course that group has done that a number of times with other people for me that is just hugely hugely sad and is so contradictory to the love of god and forgiveness and relationship which and i just feel i did i i almost cried when i saw it i was so upset that uh, this was publicly said i know it goes on in private but to publicly come and therefore to make it okay for other people to do the same over what because now the precedent is set that in the mystic movement you can separate over people because they don't agree with you and this was the issue they don't agree with me and if you don't agree with me you can't be part of this group that to me is denominational and divisive and i was so saddened over it and i'm not going to mention the person's name but people will have seen it probably and will probably know who it is but it, i was i you know almost brought me to tears when i saw it you know because i was interested i saw this video come up on facebook and it was like oh, what's this about looked at it and immediately it was like you know no i'm withdrawing relationship because of this doctrine and this that and the other and it was just like oh sad you know and actually it's it's pretty re relevant anyway whether someone's being afflicted by a familiar spirit or they're being afflicted by a spirit of someone who or a soul of someone who's not yet passed on irrelevant the issue is how can we help someone to be free not what was the source that that bondage was freedom is the issue let's focus on freeing people from whatever the source might be and to be honest does it really matter what the source is if actually the issue is freedom for somebody you know arthur burke who originally i think was the one i first saw talk about alien human spirits in his terminology and then i met a guy in the uk and a couple in the uk who were also doing the same sort of ministry and they i think referred to it as you know lingering human spirits and i prefer lingering human souls because i don't think people's spirits linger here i think they go back to the father but i do think people's souls can linger here and we should help them to pass over and preach the gospel to them so they pass over in a restored state rather than in an unrestored state in their own thinking but that's their choice um you know i'm not there to punish them or to uh, annihilate them you know and actually even with you know familiar spirits my focus is not on the spirit or the the demon or whatever you want to call it it's on the freedom of the person and we spent too much time delivering people and not enough time helping people stay free by helping them know their identity where they wouldn't need to be afflicted by things that would deceive them in their own thinking if you know who you are you don't get deceived you know and 
you know, I'm not against setting people free, that's for sure. But I certainly um, was saddened over the fact that, yeah, this is this has taken place really. Yeah, yeah. Mary, get your hand up there. Uh, yeah, uh, talking about the whole thing about lingering, lingering spirits, lingering souls. How does that actually happen? I mean, do you understand that? Yeah, I, I know what you're talking about, but I try to figure. Okay, how does how does the spirit go on, but the soul gets stuck? Well, because it says in Ecclesiastes that the spirit goes back to the father, but the spirit and soul, if not connected, in a sense of entering into that relationship um, that Jesus has already accomplished, then the soul is has not entered through jesus but the spirit was always come from god the spirit came into the body to form the soul mm -hmm. yeah. if you like the soul formed after the spirit entered into the cells and the spirit for soul formed but the spirit always existed and just goes back to where it was before the spirit for me i don't believe in an unredeemed spirit i believe the spirit has always been from god just was not connected to our identity and therefore was competing because it talks about the tension between the soul and spirit and the sort of almost the conflict between soul and spirit where the spirit looks to bring us into the relationship with our identity and god and the soul's resistant in operating in humanism and tree of the knowledge of good and evil so there are, you know even when someone first identifies that they are alive to god it doesn't automatically mean their soul gives up, does it? Having control over their lives. So I do believe Ecclesiastes talks about the spirit going back to the father. And that's been my experience of seeing it. And then the soul goes on to the fire of God's presence for refining and purification. Now, if it gets stuck here, it's because of trauma. I think trauma traps potentially souls to an event or a place and that could be to a family event and therefore it can therefore be attached to family lines as a familial spirit which can attach itself to certain families so i have i've sort of when someone dies and they have a familial spirit where does that familial spirit go well it just becomes someone who attaches itself to another part of the family and some people's deliverance is from familial spirits which are demons which were in the family member that then afflicted another family member because of some family right to do it so i do accept that some deliverance is that probably most of it might be that but that doesn't mean all of it can be that and arthur burt who operates empirically with evidence said very clearly that you probably weren't going to find this in the bible and it probably isn't a biblical thing well neither is 99 percent of the things we do every day in the bible but it doesn't mean we we dismiss it as being true it's like computers are true they're not in the bible it's like so what's the, so why would we think everything is in the bible it isn't so the fact that there may be so well jesus did talk about demons or unclean spirits which I would say an unclean spirit is actually a lingering human soul. He described it in those terms. Um, and because unclean was someone who wasn't in the covenant. You know, unclean wasn't just like a, a sinner in one sense. Obviously, sin was part of it, but it was an ex an excommunication or being outside of the covenant was really because Gentiles were unclean. You know, that, that was the view. You know, Gentiles were whatever they call them, Goyim or whatever, were unclean. They, they were unclean people. They weren't people. So unclean as a term may just refer to that. So Jesus may have referred to different classes of spirit souls, demons, whatever they are. Because I don't believe demons are spirits. I, I mean, they are spiritual identities, but they're a soul. They're the souls that were on earth and they wander around earth looking to afflict somebody or outwork their personality. And I believe they are the those who were not human, who died in the flood, who were some way Nephilim spirited 
people or mixture and didn't have a human spirit and therefore had had a soul and i think they were manufactured in hebrew you know talks about it in genesis 6 through angels mixing some sort of genetic dna thing to create hybrids and if so what would be what would be their ultimate landing space so to speak the ne- something like the nephilim where it is not a really a, a pure human soul where it is a mixture well this this well, if they didn't have a human spirit, then and they died in the flood, then they remained on earth, roaming the earth, looking for a soul to possess. Well, there weren't too many souls to possess after the flood. There was only eight. <laughs> so, so there weren't too many. And they certainly seemed to attach themselves to one group of that family line straight away. Which were ham. Mm-hmm. And they then seem to have genetic because I think genetically they may well have had stuff passed to them, which was a an attraction, let's say, to those demons. Well, let's call them that if you want to call them that, uh, who then uh, created nations of those that were totally anti-God um, and were idol worshippers and all of that. And some of them happened to be giants. So some of them seem to be purely Nephilim, which is genetically possible. You know, if you look at Noah as being pure in his generations, which I believe is genetic purity, it doesn't talk about Noah's wife, who was obviously human, but may have had some Cain seed, may have had some Nephilim seed within her DNA. And therefore, Noah's children may have had a mixture or may have been pure. And I believe the line of sort of that comes from Seth all the way to Noah, right through obviously to Jesus, I think is pure because I think um, Shem had pure human DNA because that's possible when you have, uh, let's say, a quarter DNA or half a DNA, and then you mix with that, you get full DNA. So you, it's all, I mean, I don't go into genetics, but you know enough about hybridization and F1 hybrids and all that sort of stuff to know that you can have recessive and dominant genes and all that stuff within genetics, human genetics. And I believe that Shem, Ham and Japheth had different mixtures of genetic material and that Ham attracted and eventually his wife may also have had a mixture of that and may have had some a lot of that and then he produced nephilim children which were giants who had six toes and six fingers and all sorts of stuff you know because it says that those nephilim were there after the flood as well as before the flood in hebrews well i don't believe there was another incursion of watcher angels because they got chained up so there was a genetic propagation of that and the seed of cain serpent seed also was there mixed in because jesus called some of them you know of your father the devil <laughs> you know so they must have had some serpent seed how much of it i don't know um but he certainly called some of them that and it does say that the enemy planted sons of his kingdom in the world which i think is the seed of cain um but no, ultimately, had, say like, uh, ultimately say like the Nephilim, what eventually happens to them? Okay, well, my view was that everything that Jesus could cre- created would be restored. And that includes all fallen angels that he created by him, through him, for him in Colossians. Mm-hmm. It talks about that. So for me, I have no doubt that all, any being that Jesus created for a purpose, for relationship, will be restored, including Lucifer. But it's a choice, and well, I do believe eventually you'll make that choice. But I don't know how long that will take, but I do believe all that he created will be restored. But he didn't create Nephilim. Right. Angels and man did in collusion. So what the father, and I thought to me it would be, well, maybe they'll just cease to exist or be annihilated or whatever, because God didn't create them. They didn't have a human spirit. Therefore, they don't have the spirit soul coming together in relationship but as i then matured in sort of relationship with father and he could talk to me about some stuff which originally he wasn't talking to me about because i did ask him the question he just didn't give me an answer 
um, eventually he did talk to me and said, well, when it came about, actually, when when he first engaged me about creating something, you know, not an inanimate thing, but in creating a guardian for portals out in the solar system, which didn't have enough guardians. And I sort of said to him, can I do that? And he said, well, you choose to create other things. Why do you think made in my image you wouldn't be able to create a being for a purpose like i've created beings for purposes so i thought oh okay and i was asked by guardians to do this and i went and checked it out the father and he said well yeah of course you can do it i said well why do i need to do it you know and i was a bit so like surely you created enough of them <laughs> did, did they a load of them fall then he said no none of them fell but I didn't, we didn't, we left a lot for man to complete as they matured in our image. So there's stuff left for us to do. And that is one of it. And so I was all in this at the time. Um, and so I was thinking about the responsibility of that, which I created. Am I responsible for, for that guardian? What am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to look after it? What am I supposed to do? I mean, I was like, oh, oh. you know, it's a little bit like, oh, this is a bit. You know, which probably, you know, why you didn't talk to me about it earlier, because I would have probably like, you know, even more freaked out. You know, but so I think so it's like you created it because you were asked to create it for a purpose. And the other guardians will make sure that it's cared for. Oh, praise God. I don't have to look after them. Right. Uh, a bit beyond my my sort of desire, really, at least, if not capacity. Um, but then the father then talked about um, sort of as we mature, we will also make decisions based on judgment because it talks about us judging angels. Now, obviously, people think about that judgment in the negative sense, but I believe it's a positive sense. So I would judge fallen angels as restorable, and I judge those non fallen angels for what they've done and they've blessed me so i thank them and i'm appreciative of the things they've done in my life and around my life so i honor them for what they've done to bless me so that's a form of judgment you know so i think people just get this so negative thing about judgment it's always punishment or whatever no it's about blessing i think pamela first sort of put me onto that thing i think actually when she shared that she did that and i thought oh yeah why that's a really good that's a really good way of thinking about it so i i actually chose to do that and found it they were very receptive to it you know in the right way so the father was talking to me about judging angels and and about creating and he said when you mature to a position of like fatherhood rather than just sonship then you can choose to do that to judge what you've created and immediately i'm like ah is he talking about demons so i asked him the question are you talking about demons? And he said, yes. So man will choose what happens to them. But I believe restored man, <laughs> mature man and mature sonship. So what will I choose? I would choose to do exactly what Jesus did to me and to the fallen angels to choose to restore them. And I believe that obviously God wants us to behave like he has to his creation to anything we might have created in the past or might create in the future and so for me i now believe that there is a possibility that they can be restored to what is the question and i still don't know the answer to that but maybe to something we assign them to because they don't have a purpose in god do they because god never created them in the first place with a yeah. destiny so we may need to assign destiny to them so they can be rest, restoration is probably a wrong word because restoration is something that already exists to something already exists mm -hmm. whereas maybe this is something that they will we will choose that they can continue with a purpose which will be a good purpose and that they would obviously have to choose to come through forgiveness of jesus for what they have done so far and receive that because they ain't going to get away scot-free are they they're going to have to come and acknowledge that they need jesus 
you know so maybe we will offer them that perhaps now i know people really struggle with this stuff and and i know you know these sort of things cause a lot of people to struggle because they're conditioned by the whole now oh, they're all going to be sent into the lake of fire well what's the lake of fire the love of god so you know which was made for the devil and his angels yes well actually that wasn't talking about the devil or angels it was talking about the religious leaders and their followers or workers you know in context that's what revelation was in context was the whole end of the old covenant system so it wasn't talk you know because the word for devil diabolos or for satan satanos accuser and for angels angelos can be applied to humans as well as spirit beings and it's a it's a greek word you know angelos the messenger isn't it so well they're human messengers as well as angelic ones so it, it doesn't you know we can, must just not assume that what we've got in english is actually the correct translation or meaning of the original and i don't think it is but even if it was that fire is still for purification and refining and not for destruction or punishment or torment you know okay uh, thank you yeah okay so you know it does it does open up all sorts of okay where is our thinking coming on and are we willing to forgive everyone who's afflicted us including the demons as jesus actually asked the father to do because he'd obviously already done it publicly before anyone had ever asked for it or ever done anything in any way they were he was being crucified at the time which was actually before he went into death which was linking back to what he had done in representing man before the foundation of the world which is why he could ask for forgiveness because it was based on god's love for his creation and jesus identification with his creation as the lamb who identified with the sheep you know jesus was not a sheep he was a shepherd wasn't he but he took on the role of a sheep you could say he was also expressed as a lion who took on the role of a sheep of a of a lamb because he identified with us in our brokenness to fully bring about our restoration well that was done before the foundation of the world so jesus asked the father to forgive them even before he went into death um, death dealt with the wages of our lost identity which that's that was death punishment was never the wages of lost identity the wages of sin is death all died in adam all lost identity and died in adam in christ all were made alive because he overcame death um, sort of gives a jesus came to take away the sin of the world <laughs> you know, not to punish it <laughs> you know, so. <sighs> so my getting back to dan's uh, uh initial question and comments so the soul really needs to be um will mind and emotions have to be um framed or you know going through the deconstruction of our thinking what we've been taught and mm. through religious groups and through trauma and um things that we have been spoken to us mm. have framed how we perceive who we are mm. then you know we come along and we meet jesus and we're happy and you know everything's cool until we have this struggle with our soul that says i want to go this direction but our spirit is being drawn and wooed by god to go his direction and it's all basically out of relationship and trust and all of that with our with our desire to get to know our purpose and destiny in god but then we have this soul part of us that is warring with us you know and then we, because of the pressure of it, we yield to it or the desire, I guess, I, I, I'm not sure. But so when a person goes through that, that deconstruction of what we believed into really what the truth is, mm -hmm. is that a continual process? 
through the course of our life on earth where, um, or is there a place where we, maybe I'm answering my own question, but there, there isn't a place, is there a place of perfection where we come to, or maturity, I guess is a better word, where we know that we know that we know that the soul comes into agreement with our spirit and that unity takes place? You know what I mean? Yeah, 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 no, I know what you mean. I would say that the renewing of the mind is an ongoing process, but it may come a point where we have ascended to a state of maturity where there is nothing left to renew. (laughs) We're in total agreement, but that doesn't mean that we know everything. There may still therefore be encounters and knowledge and wisdom and understanding of things which go beyond that, because I believe Adam was sinless in that he knew his identity and had never done anything outside of that identity, outside of the spirit that filtered. He he perceived life and reality through spirit, not soul, primarily first. So before his memory received anything that was stored or knowledge or understanding, it came through the spirit because he was clothed in spirit. His spirit clothed his soul and body. Therefore, he wasn't primarily functioning in the physical realm first, but the spiritual, and therefore everything was interpreted the right way, and therefore was only interpreted through his relationship with the Father. That was how Adam was, um, and therefore, when he chose to be operate independently by following Eve, um, so that she could be restored or redeemed then he lost his identity i don't think he knew he didn't deliberately want to but he wanted eve to be saved if you like and therefore he knew that she wouldn't be saved on her own so he chose to sacrifice himself because he was the first type of christ if you like so he sacrificed himself on behalf of eve like jesus did for the whole sense of mankind you know as an offering so he offered himself in, in a way now, of course, he's responsible because it doesn't say man died in Eve, did it? It says man died in, in all were dead in Adam. So he became the figurehead of that choice. Um, but he then hid away because he lost his he lost the covering of his spirit. He never he never knew the world from any other way other than relationship with the father. So therefore, if Adam had not done that. He would have matured. He would have increased or ascended in maturity by engaging the firestones and the reflection of the nine stages of man that would eventually become 12, which we see from the nine firestones and the 12 stones on the high priest breastplate, which was a man and God together in union and oneness. So included in this created order, the man and God would be ruling together in oneness which is sort of the intention. Now that would have been through a whole load of processes. Now I've engaged the Firestones in my own journey that's brought me into a maturing state of each encounter that takes me sort of higher, if you like, or deeper into God or whatever way to put it. Um, but there, there are you know many stages of that. Um, now, restoration... I don't believe will take us back to where Adam was. Restoration will be taking us to where God intended Adam to be. So that that will be more and more mature. Now, when we get to a stage where we would be where Adam was intended to be, then I think things will shift. Maybe shifting into a different age because it talks about ages to come. Now, that was obviously originally referring to Old Covenant Age, New Covenant Age. But actually, are there other ages to come that have other levels of ascension? Because I do believe we will be transfigured to operate with our spirit primarily again, clothing our being. And therefore, heaven and earth will be restored to relationship and we will be able to reconnect 
in the whole of our being living in different realms or dimensions because i think adam was able to walk into eden see i don't believe the tree of life was ever in adam's garden it was because it really represented the pathway of following life which was god to jesus you know even though you, jesus was not physically there he still existed as the son of god and as the light and way the truth and the life and all of that so the tree of life is a representative of of living in jesus and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is a representative of living in independence it's actually not a tree it's a it's a path of choice it's the choice that we made to follow our own path and there were those of adam's children who didn't sin according to the likeness of adam who followed the path through the fiery sword back through into the realms of heaven and walked in the realms of heaven and still have a physical body just like enoch and elijah and others so i don't think um we have to look at it as just the level of understanding or maturity that we now know and what that might be i believe ultimately we will be transfigured to fully become who adam would have become had he continued the process of maturity and then we will go beyond so restoration will in a sense come to an end when god's original purpose is restored although there will be no end to the increase in his government of peace so there will still be an ongoing process i think of us becoming more like him you know so you could say will restoration ever end will his increase ever end will peace never end no probably not so but i don't know i don't understand or have been given revelation of what that might be like but i do think the father has said to me and what he has said is you will ascend to be ascended fathers you will become an ascended father which carries with it a different level than being a son so will i create something that i become father to eventually when i'm in that state well i've learned an awful lot about the whole process i would certainly hope if i did i wouldn't want to go through the same process <laughs> that this one has gone so i'd be like okay is there a caveat that it can't fall down into the mess that we've ended up in because i wouldn't want to create something well then how do you create something that doesn't have choice i mean it's these are philosophical questions i think which are sort of quite wide reaching and are beyond the scope of my uh, level of intellect at the moment uh, of understanding but i'm not saying we won't get there or have a level of understanding which will enable us to understand things differently it's like at the moment i was reading an article earlier that the uk government has just received the first quantum computer and the uk is in is in the forefront of quantum computing technology and and advance and exploration in it so they've just received, guess where it went i mean it won't be difficult to guess where it went military of defense ministry of defense of course <laughs> yeah yeah there we go anyway yeah should give it to the health service you know but they didn't but anyway quantum computing operates on a such a different level to what we're used to in computing which is on binary zeros and ones quantum computing operates on superposition existing or not existing which is obviously quantum physics of being non-local or local so it, it can do computations which are beyond the wildest imagination of any binary programming or computer now that's what it could be like when our minds are transformed or we take on an ascended consciousness or an enlightened consciousness which goes beyond what we couldn't even imagine i mean even computing i mean go back 100 100 years you know when they were using abacuses or they first started to invent mechanical calculators and they're i mean fascinating when you look at those old first calculators and then you got the first 
calculating machines and uh, even the first computer which was like you know in a huge room with like massive fans because of the heat and extraction and these huge big tape things and all this stuff and now you've got you've got more power in my watch than they had on the whole of the apollo mission you know i mean it's lit ridiculous but that's what's going on well think of our expansion of our consciousness and the abilities of our consciousness to be creative like god we don't have any in a sense anything to compare it or any it's so hard to think what could it be like because in a sense we're we're still operating on binary or we're still operating on an abacus let's say when actually we'll be operating on a quantum computer which will be able to do an infinite number of calculations every microsecond it's just it's it's like you know talking to someone in the 17th century about an iphone and hoping that we could have a conversation that they would have any understanding of what you're talking about god could be talking to me in something that my i have no way of actually being able to reference it to anything you know i've had experiences like that of going into dimensions that had no reference point in this dimension so i couldn't i just couldn't describe it i had no way of describing it because it had no reference point to the grid that i'm used to which was like well i think that probably will be where we will end up in sonship it will be beyond the measure that even now we could even think about but it's fun fun i mean i do think you know i do you know sort of have those conversations with god in a limited fashion and i think he's communicating stuff to me that i still don't have a grid for that i couldn't even describe and i couldn't even write down but i think he is talking to me and he is sharing his heart with me but at a heart to heart level rather than a conscious understanding level so i think those things in me are part of me and i think they are the part of me that is always looking for something beyond but there is always going to be beyond beyond and beyond beyond and beyond 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 because that's i think programmed in by my intimacy with the father who knows that i can contain this as a intellectual question and answer or information but i can have it within me as something which draws me and desires that i would continue to pursue ascension and maturity um yeah yeah mary uh, just a quickie, uh, when you had mentioned that the tree of life, that you, you believe that that really was not actually a tree, but a choice, you know, to follow Jesus. Why well, would at, at one level, it's definitely a tree because I've eaten fruit from it and I've walked through it. It is a tree at one level, but there's more levels to what the meaning of that tree is. Well, then the question is, why would the father tell them not, not to partake of it, not to touch it? You know, that's the thing that I, I sort of yeah. grapple with. If that I, is the I ultimate think goal. Because, because they would have needed to come to a point of maturity to be able to have taken it and therefore not risk falling into a state that if you were immortal, you'd end up in a state of perpetual lost identity. So okay. God knew where we were going, obviously, and didn't want us to be immortal and then choose to follow our own path in a sense of you know so he don't touch this if they hadn't have touched either and have ascended to the point where that was no longer a way they were even going to choose then following that path and taking the path of of life which would not end physically would have then be something that we can enter into and i think the same applies to us today you know why would anyone want to be immortal and miserable it's like you know I, I do not want to live forever in a miserable state that means in a state of any sense of entropy you know of deterioration or anything else i, I want the fullness of health to continue to live in not sort of you know well i'm gonna live forever and i will I'm, and i'm gonna have dementia i mean that'd be ridiculous wouldn't it you know yeah. in one sense i mean the spirit could be still active so and i know people with dementia their spirit is still very active and so that's why they're not dead some people 
you know it seems to be because they're still functioning you know i i was you know my father-in-law who was you know was a a, a man who, who followed god and was a great great guy um you know had his all the religious stuff but actually was a really loving guy and i think was a really sort of good testimony of of what what a loving person was i sensed you know when he had dementia uh, and when he, he was like you know didn't recognize you know people and all of that i engaged his spirit and his spirit was extremely active even though he probably wouldn't have understood that while he was alive even or while he was ministering he probably wouldn't have understand that level of spiritual activity i i engaged it and i thought yeah he's not finished what he's doing you know in the spirit um so i, I you know i look at it in those terms and i think it's, it's more than just what we see on the surface i think um and therefore you know god obviously god is god <laughs> so <laughs> he's aware of everything uh and therefore you know had had taken account of the path and the journey and i don't think wanted uh, anybody to risk in a fallen state having to live in that fallen state with that end because that would have been horrendous so he put into place the process okay and i think for them to engage that tree you had to be walking in the realms of heaven because it was in it was in the eden not the garden east of eden so the tree of life was always in eden not in the east of eden the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was east of eden because that was their garden and they chose uh, from that choice and it's you know literally it's more about the what the spiritual meaning of that choice was rather than it being a literal tree you know it, it may have been a tree i i can't say i went back and looked at it but i think it was more the opportunity to choose and they chose and eve chose the offer to be like god which she already was um but through their her own humanistic efforts and that was the deception that she entered into adam was not deceived it says he wasn't deceived he knew what he was doing but i don't think he did it for bad reasons i think it was a good reason he did it but he still was he still got the the blame you know um of course he blamed eve when when as soon as as soon as he and she blamed god so it was like well you made that serpent you know it's your fault you shouldn't have put him there in the first place you know it's just like because immediately they lost their whole connection and now they're defending themselves with their own understanding you know which just didn't take long did it no not at all but it was a huge shock for them to be clothed in glory to have lost that glory to that being separated from that glory and separated from god in the sense of how it was god obviously engaged them and clothed them with skin and the whole thing of blood and all that stuff sort of comes into it. i know there's lots of theories around that them saying that light was can blood is congealed light and whatever you know you'll find that if you look into heart math and other things and i know i'm sort of like yeah okay if it is it is if it didn't it doesn't really bother me too much whether it's true or not and you find all sorts of things stated and then you go and try and find out where they came from or who discovered that or who's saying it and it's quite hard to it's quite hard to track down the source or the origin of certain things sometimes um when sometimes say and but i go on what i resonate with does that resonate in my spirit as true yes well i'm going to accept that is true even if i can't find the source because i accept it as true because it seems to align with the truth that i'm finding in jesus so i don't need the source in everything for me to think that is true you know so i don't need proof um because i resonate with truth um so sometimes it's interesting to find out where it came from but not always you can find it and you can't always find the source of everything that's been said but is it true does it carry the hallmark of the frequency of truth yeah okay well i'm happy to accept yeah you know, maybe not all of it but some of it because sometimes there's a mixture in what's being said anyway anyway yeah dan yeah, uh, quickly, you stated earlier that, and I've heard you say also before in the past, that Adam uh, was redeeming Eve. I, I don't understand that. What do you mean by that? I don't think you're saying 
to whatever Adam did to Eve. No. Uh, well, God, God reiterated what would happen, that through the seed of the woman, that mankind would be saved. Because Jesus was the seed of the woman. Um, now, obviously, that also came through Adam as a line because Seth were well, able and then Seth came through Adam. Cain didn't came through Adam. Cain was a result of the serpent implantation of DNA. So the twins, which is by fundification, you know, twins from different fathers, which is a scientific possible fact because it's happened. Um, those twins obviously came from a different source. Now, ultimately, Jesus, I don't really believe um had eve or adam's dna I, th I think he was he had an implanted egg put into eve but obviously the symbol of it was you know there now therefore what adam did was to choose that eve wouldn't die alone you know or die in that state and i think inherently he knew something of the father's heart. So then when God meets them and talks to them and tells them of what will happen, he talks about Eve, the, you know, Jesus coming to crush the Satan's head and all of that stuff. So he's prophesying of Jesus actually coming um, in the way he did. Um, so I, I think that's what Adam was doing. No, Adam, he didn't redeem eve from the point of saved her in any way like jesus could do it but he without the seed of the woman then there would have been no ongoing line now she could have you know there were children that existed at that point so there it could have been but i think his choice was i know that this is a deception but i am not leaving my wife That, that's you know and i have had conversation around it although trying to get a, a straight answer out of one of the cloud of witnesses sometimes is not always easy you know because it's almost like they don't have permission to tell you everything so adam did talk to me about his children and all the thousands of children they had before they entered that state and those mm -hmm. who then chose to go back through the path to the tree of life and and, and those who didn't and chose some chose god as father and some chose adam as father those were the ones that cain was able to go and find who had cities out there because there were a lot of them and they'd already expanded you know so they weren't not fruitful they weren't you know disobedient if you like from the beginning because time didn't exist in the same framework time fell well difficult for it's a difficult concept but it, time was not the same before as after and so there was a lot of people who were children of adam and eve and there was no fallen sense so they were able to reproduce without there being this genetic issue over brothers and sisters that that's a concept which came through law you know you know and you know there seems to be times through history where different things seem to apply you know abraham wasn't ever told off for having different wives you know god didn't seem to have a problem with you know jacob having two sisters as wives <laughs> yeah i think i think jacob had a problem with it i think you know because he was you know deceived into it by laban you know tricked into it um but that actually may have been what he reaped from so if he sowed what he reaped you know reap what he sowed you know because he deceived into receiving the having him lay hands on him and bless him you know so there was a bit of um yeah a bit of karma there i guess you got back he got back a little bit and being deceived but you know there are certain things that didn't seem to be an issue and then there are things which we have applied so it's interesting you know i, I was asking this question the other day of the what is marriage you know is it the piece of paper and the legal thing that we have or is it something from god's perspective very different no i'm not against marriage and not against a legal piece of paper but actually we know a legal piece of paper doesn't stop people 
doing things contradictory to what they vowed in marriage does it so in a sense what is marriage from god's perspective and how does he view it and you know the new testament doesn't say an awful lot other than you know the marriage bed should be faithful and i think that's absolutely correct but really doesn't go into a whatever ceremony or words or anything else obviously there was an old covenant perspective to marriage and they did have a process went through the sort of betrothal process to the consummation process and all of that but they also had a concept of people girls could be married at 13 or something and basically sold off almost traded for a position or territory or a favor and it was like i certainly wouldn't think that we'd call it human trafficking and, and child abuse today and that was acceptable in those days and i don't think that would be something i would want to see as an acceptable state of what marriage is so we've got to you've got to take it out of the context and put it into today's context and i think find out well what is god's view today about lots of things we may have assumptions about because we may be programmed by culture or by some religious programming into seeing things a way which maybe god doesn't view and maybe having a fresh understanding of how god wants us to relate to what he's doing today you know rather than try and apply you know 2000 or 4000 year old principles when he wants us no it's never going to be opposite to love and i think that's always the measure of whether anything is true or tricar is truth is it aligned to love and if you measure it against love i don't think you can go too far wrong you know because god is always going to look at the heart and love first before any external issues um you know but it does throw up a lot of questions that which i think we should be potentially asking where how does how do we live and how do we establish the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven today what is the way you want us to do that you know and i think certainly not the way most of the religious stuff is done <laughs> from my perspective anyway hi everyone we're starting a patreon page patreon.com slash freedom arc and we would like to invite you to partner with us in taking the message of god's unconditional love limitless grace triumphant mercy to a bigger global audience 